welcome to Globus Books presentation of Osip Mandelstam written by Ilya Bernstein. He's a poet and a translator, born in Moscow, and uh, he came to the US as a child in 1980s. Um, a collection of his translations of Mandelstam uh, poems uh, by M. Graph Express from 2020 has recently been published in a second revised edition with a new extended afterword on the poems. In addition to Mandelstam, he has translated the children's writing of Daniel Harms and edited Evgeny Baratinsky, A Science Not for the Earth, Selected Poems and Letters, published by Ugly Duckling Press in 2015. Ilya Berstein's own writings have appeared most recently in Stand, Arian, LVNG, and his poetry collections include Attention and Man by Ugly Duckling Press, 2003, and Distances and Sounds, uh, published by Arts Interpress in 2020. And um, I will briefly introduce Globus Books, which is an independent bookstore serving San Francisco since 1971. Uh, it offers a wide range and stock of books on all things Russia and former Soviet Union. Globus is actively working with the libraries across the states on completing their holdings for Russian publications, both contemporary and out of print. The Globus Books team is well known for its expertise in first editions of Russian literature, books on the Russian avant-garde, early imprints, and travel and voyage books. Under the new management, Globus tries to serve the Bay Area, bridging gaps and continuing cultural traditions and giving voices to underrepresented communities. We have a wonderful schedule of events coming this fall, so if you haven't checked it yet, please do on our website. And from here, I will be very happy to pass microphone to Ilya. Ilya, welcome and thank you for being with us. Thank you for inviting me to be with you. This is a book uh, just published, recently published. Many of the faces I see on the screen already uh, have seen this book. Um, so I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about uh, or a lot about the poems, and I will read some uh, translations from the book also uh, while talking about them. Um, so for this book, I read a long uh, afterward um, about Mundershtam's poetry, uh, in which I, um, I talked about the influences on him and uh, of other poets, and I um, talked about poets who influenced his view on uh, the, of the relationship between poetry and life, mentors, spiritual mentors. And then I talked about poets who influenced his view on the relationship between poetry and language. And I sort of, it fell sort of naturally into these two categories. And I like this distinction. I think poetry uh, has a relation to life, the life of the poet, and it has a relationship to language. And and it's sort of between these two uh, banks, uh, still in Charybdis, that it travels and it's probably aiming for something else, neither the life nor the language, but it's always in contact with both. Um, so, um, uh, thinking about uh, Madhustan's poetry and its relationship to, his view of its relation to life and to language, uh, I, I, I just thinking about this today, I, I thought, well, when you translate a poem from one language into another, uh, the poet's relation to life that's behind the poem carries over pretty smoothly into the other language. I mean, there's nothing that interferes with it. But the poem's relation to language, of course, when you take the language that it was relating to uh, when it was composed, away from it, undergoes a great upheaval. It's, it's, suddenly it finds itself on top of a new language. And it had a certain relation to language that was expressed in the poem. Now that language is gone. It has a new language uh, and uh, to, to which it has no relation at all, in a way. So um, uh, my, my interest in translating Madhishtam over many years, where I've been doing this for years, 
somehow unable to put it down, I think has been to uh, uh, try to reproduce or to, to point to uh, the relation of his poetry to language in Russian to carry that over into English, to suggest in English what his poetry's relation to language is. So even though the language is different, if that makes sense. I want to start by reading a poem which makes a nice kind of point or port of entry into his poetry and into this particular vein in his poetry, its relation, its relation to language. And this poem is one of my favorites, and um, it will, um, it is somewhat obscure, but uh, I will first read it and then um, talk about it. Not, this is a poem from the 1930s, from his last period, written when he was in exile in Voronezh. Poem from uh, the, his last half year in that exile. Not mine, not yours, but theirs. Theirs is what strength reaches the end of lineal descent. Theirs is the air that vents the vocal reed. And gratefully, the snails of human lips will draw from them a heaviness that breathes. Name have they none. Enter into their grit, and you will become heir to their dominion. And for human beings, for their living hearts, meandering in their volume, their evolvement, you will delineate what joys are theirs, and that which torments them and tides ebbing and flowing. So what is this poem about? The major influence on uh, Mandelstam's uh, view of how poetry relates to language that I talk about in my afterwards is Fiebnikov, Belimir Fiebnikov, the futurist poet, who was a slightly older contemporary of his. Uh, um, so this is not you know, by influence from, by him being an influence on, on Mandelstam, I mean that Mandelstam's voice and view of poetry was shaped when he was very young by many influences, but then it had a certain kind of, he had a certain voice uh, once he had learned the craft and uh, had absorbed the vocation. He had a certain voice, but then as, as an adult, as a mature poet, poet or a maturing poet, Sviyabnikov was, in my opinion, the main influence that he came under, and uh, the influence continued for many years and um, became deeper and deeper. Uh, so I will talk a bit uh, about Sviyabnikov's ideas and what the nature of that influence was. Sviyabnikov, when he appeared in Russian poetry, made a big splash. Uh, uh, this was in the late, in the, in the last years of the first decade of the 20th century. It was like nothing people had seen before, and uh, the main thing he did, he didn't describe it in this way, but the main thing he did was that he took um, uh, sound associations between words, and he used them as a basis for associating words in terms of their meaning. So he, words that sounded alike uh, or that had some kind of phonetic similarity, uh, he would look for some kind of semantic connection with them, between them. Uh, and uh, you know, words that sounded alike had been used in poetry for millennia as a basis for poetic form, rhymes, rhymes sound alike, and, or rhythm. Uh, and that was to organize poetry poetically, but he used uh, assonances and similarities of sound to organize poetry semantically, in a way, to, to actually inform the meaning of the poem. Uh, so this had been done before by poets uh, from time immemorial also, but he made this an explicit focus of all his poetry, and it was at the center of all his poetry. Um, and um, uh, so it, 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 it changed, it completely changed uh, the con his, the con his conception of poetry and the possible people's sense of what possible conceptions of poetry were, there were. 
Um, so he himself, to gra I mean, he wrote poems uh, using uh, this trope that I just described. Uh, he himself would not have described it in the way I just did. He, uh, to ground this vision of poetry, developed a whole mythology of language uh, eventually. Uh, in which he said that there were there were primordial sounds that had certain primal meanings uh, originally, and then they generated uh, words uh, and with more specific meanings, uh, with more concrete meanings, and so forth. And so now, you know, a lot of these words are scattered throughout the language, but the the the, the genetic connections between them are still there, um, and um, they can be brought out in poetry, and poetry derives its power from from revealing these connections. In part. Around the same time, there was uh, there were linguists who had similar theories. There was a, a linguist who became notorious in the Soviet Union named Mar. I mean, famous, and then in, in the in the twenties and thirties, he became sort of the official linguist, and then at some point later on, he was criticized by the establishment. He had similar ideas. So, in linguistics, in linguistics, you know, they were rejected. But in poetry, they served Yamnikov well. And uh, Maglishtam um, was very much taken by poetry. Uh, Yamnikov's approach, in fact, everybody was taken. Every, all of his contemporaries were taken by Yamnikov's approach. And even the older generation was very impressed by it. And Maglishtam expressed, uh, described, the same um, notions uh, in an essay that I, from the early 1920s that I quote from in my afterward at length. Uh, uh, so he, the image he gave was of uh, roots, the roots of words, meaning not just the etymological roots of words, but the um, sound roots, the, the kernels that made up the words. Uh, waging war against each other underground. Under, underneath the ground of language was the meanings on, you know, being the plants that we can see around us. Uh, underground, a war was incessantly being fought uh, among the different roots. Uh, a war uh, uh, between, among the roots competing for nourishment and sustenance, the juices, water, whatever's in the soil. And so, and this work emerges, you know, and splashes out onto the surface in, in different verbal constructions that actually have a meaning. Underground, the underground meaning is not formed. There is some meaning, it's not just sound, but it's proto-semantic, as you might say. Uh, so this poem that I just read uh, is a, um, uh, a wonderful, and, uh, expression of this idea and an embodiment of it. Uh, the, uh, the idea that Mendelstam described, as he described it, was from the 20s, from, the 19, from an essay in the 20, that he wrote in the 20s, um, where he was interested in the, these ideas, but it took them uh, a fair amount of time to penetrate into his own writing. So he, he, he could approach them discursively, but to assimilate them as skills, they were, the way Slyavnikov had them as skills uh, was a gradual process and sort of a lifelong education for Mandrashtam as I see it. So let me read the poem again and um, maybe it'll make more sense now. So this is a poem about these roots. It was written 13 years or 14 years after the essay I just uh, talked about. Um, but the idea is the same idea, it seems to me, um, although it's presented in a rather mysterious way. So the, the subject of the poem are, are the roots of words um, in which all the power of language inheres. Not mine, not yours, but theirs. Theirs is what strength reaches the end of lineal descent. Theirs is the air that vents the vocal reed, and gratefully the snails of human lips will draw from them a heaviness that breathes. Name have they none. Enter into their grit, and you will become heir to their dominion. 
and for human beings, for their living hearts, meandering in their values, their evolved, you will delineate what joys are theirs and that which torments them in tides ebbing and flowing. Perhaps I was able to make for you a little sense of this beautiful but outwardly obscure poem. Um, um, so um, this idea uh, of Hrebnikov's, uh, uh, this approach to poetry, uh, and why everybody was taken by it. I just, I want to elaborate on a little more because it was actually, uh, in my view, a central, a central trope of all of Russian modernism. This was all these poets uh, whose names you know were uh, using this, making use of this idea in one way or another. Uh, so the idea itself is actually, um, Sviyabnikov presented it in this mytho-poetic way, and Medrashtam talked about it in this poetic way, but the idea itself can also be described, I think, uh, in a psychological way, it makes sense. If words that uh, sound the same, and that you've been living with your whole life, and have been associating in your brain, just because they sound the same or look the same on the page, that these words for you should have also some kind of strange semantic connection, some kind of connection in terms of their meaning as well as their sound. I don't know. Uh, for example, the words iron and irony or something like that. You know, every time you see the word irony, you see the word iron in it. And so it might not be, you know, completely strange uh, to hear somebody describe, a poet describe as, um, you know, irony is rusty or sarcasm is rusty or something like this. I mean, these associations kind of live together. The phonetic associations live together because they sound alike and each of them is surrounded by an orbit and clusters of semantic associations that also hang together. So from a psychological point of view, from an, an associationist point of view, I think it's, it's, it's not an unreasonable vision of language. And similarly, uh, if you look at the history of language, uh, language seems to uh, itself seems to think the way Slyavnikov thinks. If you look at the etymology, at the history of practically any word, uh, you're likely to find in its history moments where its um, um, meaning was slightly reshaped to resemble the sound of words that had that had similar meanings to it, um, or its meaning was slightly reshaped to resemble the meanings of words that sounded like it, or where its sound was slightly reshaped to resemble the sound of words that meant something similar. Um, that's it. Uh, once you start looking for examples of this, you find them everywhere. Uh, so uh, as a historical process, uh, uh, language seems to develop very much along Slebnikovian lines. Um, and in fact, this is a way to make sense of that old uh, concept of the genius of a language, I think, um, where uh, you know, words entering, new words entering a language are reshaped um, by the genius of the language to make it conform to that, to the spirit of the language. Uh, I think that is what's going on. A word will enter a language and then the language will reshape its sound uh, according to words that it, are similar to it in, 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 in meaning or reshape its meaning according to words that are similar to it in sound. I actually, you can see this going on in Russian right now. Uh, the flood of English words coming into Russian, and they're all being slightly reshaped by Russian, um, uh, whether in terms of meaning or in terms of sound. Deep idea, I think, a broad, broad idea about about language and about what poetry can use, the resources that poetry can find in language. Um, and in fact, this idea. Um, I see it as a, as a central idea to sort of what's, what's known as the Silver Age of Russian poetry. So Khlebnikov uh, appeared 
with this idea on his banner in the first decade of the century. And then a little, almost at the same time as Klyabnikov, uh, a younger poet, Pasternak, Boris Pasternak, had basically the same idea right from the beginning, uh, although he presented it in a, in a very different way from Klyabnikov. So, uh, but, but the idea of associating words uh, uh, semantically based on phonetic association is right at the heart of Pasternak as much as it is in Klyabnikov. So, in, in fact, both of these poets, I think, I'm giving a little background, stepping back from Mandrishtam, but I will come back to Mandrishtam, so don't worry. Um, uh, both of these poets, I think, with Kriyavnikov and Pasternak, I see them as sort of language monsters. Like they were very interested, they were extremely sensitive to all the associations uh, that language presented them with, any entrance into language presented them with. And in a way, they you know, they, their obsession with language was as great as their obsessions with poetry. So they were partly, uh, you know, poets and partly these linguistic creatures. And the way they presented their uh, linguistic involvement in poetry was very different. So Kriyavnikov um, flaunted it. He put this, these ideas forward as explicitly as the, the core of his poetry. And uh, used them, they were such a strong, they, their, their effects were so strong that then he, he, he felt he used them to dispense with every other convention of poetry. So he, you know, formal conventions, meter, rhyme, he, he, he was wildly free with them in very creative ways, but he did things that people had never done before. Um, and in a way he, you know, and, and his presentation of himself, and the subject matter of poetry, it, was, it didn't sound like poetry in a way. But uh, he was, so people were taken by all of this stuff too, but at the center of it was his sort of linguistic brilliance of, 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 of sensitivity to the association, semantic phonetic association with words. And in a way he was able to get away with all, all his other stuff, even in the eyes of the older generation, some of the older generation, because this thing that he had discovered uh, that poetry could make use of was so powerful. Um, so the future has followed him, this group, and, and breaking conventions and so on. But again, the stronger poets among them absorbed this idea. Pasternak was a completely different approach. He hid the idea. He concealed it in a poetry that looked traditional from the outside, traditional meter, traditional rhyme, and it looked like traditional lyric poetry. Uh, in fact, you could almost miss the, the fact that it was inside the inside it inside this traditional lyricism. The the language was as insanely inventive as it was in Klyavnikov. He 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 sort of hid it and presented it as classical lyric poetry in the vein of a number of 19th century Russian poets. And in fact, uh, this self-concealment in Pasternak's Part, I might add, um, there's a famous passage in Dr. Zhivago written many decades later where he describes, uh, he's talking about the kind of poetry he wants to write, the protagonist is talking about the kind of poetry he wants to write, and he says he, he wants to write poetry that was very complicated and, and linguistically rich, but that on the surface would appear perfectly simple, deceptively, deceptively simple, would be transparent on the surface. And this passage is usually taken to refer to the poetry that Pasternak himself was writing at the time he wrote Dr. Zhivaga, his late poetry, which looks very simple on the outside indeed compared to the poetry he wrote as a young man, uh, and, but is very rich inside in a concealed way. But in fact, this, uh, the same ambition to conceal under something that looks simple, something that was extremely complicated, is there right from the beginning of in Pasternak, although it, it looks more complicated than early Pasternak, but still it looks traditional compared to what Kriyavnikov did, although it was by no means traditional. It was as, as insanely and committed to, to language as, and, and associations that existed within language itself, almost independently of the poet, uh, as Kriyavnikov was. Um, so, and then to conclude this little overview, this little history uh, of Russian Silver Age 
uh, poetry, I will I will add that I see Madhustam as uh, a student of Sebnikov, as a kind of a student of Sebnikov. And actually, I see the other great poet. This is a more dubious uh, relation, but the other great poet for me of that period is Tsvetaeva, Marina Tsvetaeva, and she, in some sense, might be considered, she had a very intimate relationship, an epistolary relationship with Pasternak in the 20s, but in, she, in some sense, uh, grew greatly as a result of that relationship. Um, um, both Mandlerstam and Tsvetaeva uh, were, to my ears, right from the beginning, uh, in some sense, purer poets, uh, sort of in, in, the, in the traditional sense of a lyric, lyric poet, an Orphic lyric poet, than Pasternak and Klebnikov. So Pasternak and Klebnikov were very much committed to just working with language, in addition to whatever poetry, uh, whatever demands poetry made on them. Mangushtam uh, and Tsvitaev were, from the beginning, lyric poets. And they absorbed, well, I will now talk about Mangushtam, they absorbed the sort of Klebnikov's insights about language, he absorbed them intellectually early on. Then slowly, uh, over the course of his life, they um, penetrated more deeply in, and deeply into his own poetry. And, uh, and, and something similar might be argued to have happened with Tsvetaeva. And so they, both Medrashtam and Tsvetaeva, are, are unique or distinguished by the fact that they grew as poets greatly over the course of their lives. So Pasternak and Sliabnikov uh, cannot be said to have grown in the same way. In fact, you know, if you look at poets in general, some of them start out great, and then, you know, Pasternak started out brilliant. And then he, he did different things. But th they come across to the reader more as choices. You know, he chose to do this. He chose to send his poetry in this direction. Uh, there is no sense uh, nearly as much of a sense of a kind of a, uh, evolving uh, growth of his essence as a poet, as there is in the case of Mendelstam. So the comparison, I mean, if you think of English language poets, uh, the comparison would be, the obvious comparison uh, to a poet who did grow over the course of his life is Yeats, who, you know, his early poems are wonderful, but his middle poems are, you know, even more interesting, and his late poems are fantastic. There's a, there's a, there's a, a growth. And so both Mendelstam and Sutaeva had this. You can observe it over the course of their careers. And in um, and 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 their their stature as poets, their greatness as poets, uh, comes from the, the 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 sense of poetry and the the poems they eventually wrote and the sense of poetry they eventually used. In my mind. The late poetry is the great poetry. It makes the earlier poetry uh, interesting, more interesting. Um, so in, in honor of Mendelstam's ability to evolve and grow as a poet over the course of his life, I would like to read a poem um, that is just about uh, growth. It's not really about this, but it's, it's about um, the birth, it's called The Birth of a Smile. And it's about the birth of consciousness in the act of a baby smiling. The birth of a smile. Whatever time a child begins to smile, in one way bitterly, in one way sweetly, the far ends of its smile, all jokes aside, are lost to sight in oceanic chaos. The child feels an unconquerable joy. With the corners of its lips, it plays in glory and the rainbow scene is already being stitched for finding out what is reality. Out of the water, land has risen on its paws. The snail of the mouth washes up from under, and one Atlantic moment strikes the eyes, softly accompanied by praise and wonder. So here, the child awakening to consciousness in the act of smiling is seen as this evolutionary moment of you know sea creatures coming on land um, um, this story this poem has a story behind it he uh, he had seen somebody's baby um, 
I forget who um, Mangeshtam had uh, say uh, uh, his first word, which was the Russian word for needle, which is a three-syllable word. Uh, so uh, I guess that possibly gave him the idea of the rainbow scene being stitched. Um, there's a, a, a wonderful um, line. Um, um, the, 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 the line in the second stanza, um, a rainbow seam is already being stitched for finding out what is reality. That line, finding out what is reality in Russian, literally is for um, the endless um, finding out of reality, for the endless knowing of reality. The Russian word for uh, used in the translation of the expression know thyself um, is uh, in Russian, there are two words. There's no and there's come to know. So in the expression, uh, I don't know if that's the case in Greek, uh, but know thyself in Russian is translated as uh, come to know yourself, begin to know yourself. So and so uh, the word for finding out that I translated as finding out is this come to know. And uh, the word that he that I translated as reality is um, yaj, which is the world of phenomenal phenomenal appearances. Uh, but uh, the fir this word sounds very close to the Russian word for I. So uh, yeah, in fact, Mandershtam puns on these two words in another poem: ya and yaj, I and reality. So finding out what is reality has, to my ears, uh, built into it, finding out what is I. Um, in an example of uh, Lebnikovian um, moves in Mandershtam's poetry. So, um, so what, what, what does growth in Mandershtam over the course of his life um, um, pertain to was, uh, to go back to what I mentioned initially, was not, I mean, his, in terms of the relation between poetry and, and life and poetry and language. So his, his sense of the relation between poetry and life also changed in some way. Uh, and I, so that's as he grew and as reality changed around him. But this Sevnikovian involvement was specifically his sense of the relation between poetry and language. And, and his poetry became, uh, in a way, much more sensitive to those, those connections and underground uh, uh, wars between roots and language over the course of his life. So um, I would like to read a poem. So he, in the 20s, when he wrote this essay that I quoted from, he was... Uh, aware of these ideas, of Fiamnikov's ideas, and he was interested in them. And he has a couple of poems about them. Uh, but they are poems about them uh, less, than, um, less than poems that just use these ideas. He had a, he had, uh, a close connection. He, had, he knew Fiamnikov in the teens because they frequented the same haunts. But uh, he, uh, in the early 19, 1920s, right before Fiamnikov died, uh, he, there was a period when he would come over for dinner every time to the Mandershtam's house to, uh, because he had no food uh, rations, and they did. So they shared their food with them, with him. So he, he had some kind of personal connection at various points in his life with Fiamnikov. And then uh, as a sort of a telling fact about that connection, uh, I mentioned this in my afterward uh, in my book. Um, when Mizerstam was uh, right before his last arrest, uh, he was sent to a sanatorium, uh, and he was arrested then at the sanatorium. So it was all orchestrated uh, from above. But to the sanatorium, he took with him uh, three books. One was a volume of Dante. One 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 was a volume of Pushkin. And one was, I think it might have been more than one volume of Khyabnikov. So that was, uh, that was what was important to him at the end. 
so the poems, the two poems that he wrote in the 20s about Kriyavnikov's ideas, um, are um, uh, uh, they 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 are about the, the, their subject matter uh, is a musical scale, and they um, um, their hidden subject matter is a musical scale, and they um, they derive originally from a short poem of Kriyavnikov written around the same time actually. Um, which begins, uh, a little song is a little ladder into the heart of another, or into another heart. A little song is a little ladder into another heart. And so uh, these two poems, one is about a little song and one is about a little ladder, but both of them uh, are actually about the little song, which is a little ladder or the little ladder, which is a little song, a musical scale, scala, um, in Italian, which means ladder, staircase. So, and these two poems uh, take contrary views of this approach to language that is found in Fiatnikov's poetry, and that would eventually be found in Midrashtam. One is curious and in favor of it, and one is curious and against it. So I will read both. Uh, the first one is this. I know not when this little song began. Who scrapes along it? What thief? What tinkling mosquito prints? I would like to talk about nothing once more, to scrape a match, to push the night of it with my shoulder to throw haystacks and haystacks apart, the wearisome weight of air, to rend, to tear the sack for the caraways packed, so that the linkage of blood, the tinkle of these dried herbs, once purloined, might be found across time, haloc, and dream. Um, and the second poem, so this is, in this poem, he would like to talk about nothing. It's more just to push the night awake and see what the night felt, the linguistic night. And the second poem is, up a little, up a little ladder I climbed to a hayloft in utter disarray. I inhaled the clutter of space, the detritus of milky stars, and I thought, why awake? the swarm of drawn out sounds. In this eternal wrangle, why chase wondrous aeolian scales? The Big Dipper's stars are seven, the Earth's good senses are five. The darkness swells and tinkles and grows and tinkles again. A hay wagon, enormous, unyoked, athwart the universe stands. The ancient chaos of the hayloft will tickle, trickle a man. Not with our own skin's scale. Against the hair of the world we sing. We tune our lives as if rushing to go a fleet. Seismen restore to the nest inches that fall to the ground. I will fly from furrows that burn and return to my own row of sound. To make the linkage of blood and the dried out tinkle of grass part ways. The one made firm, the other dream mirage. So the two split up. There's the poet's voice and there's the universe of linguistic meanings tinkling and ringing all around it, um, but no longer at one with it in this poem. Um, by the way, I, as long as we're on this poem, I will mention um, uh, something that I will just talk about later, which is that Khlyabnikov and Mendrishtam and Pasternak and Svitaeva, all of them, uh, in addition to using assonances in the way I have described between Russian words in their poems, freely borrow and look to other languages as well and translate words from, that have assonances in other languages, words that have interlinguistic phonetic connections, they will translate those words back into Russian from another language. 
So this poem has a conspicuous example of this. And so actually in translating poems into English, one discovers things that one might not have necessarily noticed reading the Russian. So this, both of these poems are about a scale, scala, hence the latter. Um, but uh, in the uh, fifth, I think, fifth uh, stanza of this poem, we see the lines, not with our own skin's scale, against the hair of the world we sing. And in Russian, the word scales, the scales of, of the skin, the scales on reptiles, uh, have no relation to the scale, a musical scale, it's a different word. But in English, it's the same word, and uh, it is likely not an accident that that image found its way into the poem. Um, this ambivalence um, that appears in these two poems toward this attitude toward language uh, stayed with him in some sense, uh, late into his life. So I'd like to read a poem from the very end of his exile in Voronezh, one of his last, one of his last poems, um, which um, voices the same, in which he voices the same ambivalence. Although at this point, um, the sensitivity to language uh, that he rejects in the second of the poems that I just read, read uh, has become so much a part of his body and his own voice that there's no, there's no question of um, uh, trying to reject it. Uh, if only, the only thing possible is maybe to try to diminish it if, if one feels ambivalent about it. So um, the poem is uh, about a Greek flute. So let me read the poem and then I will talk about this. The Greek flutes Eta and Iota, unsated by word of mouth, behold them to no one, unmolded, ripened, repined, crossed rift. So let me just say um, uh, a little bit more. So this, the Greek flute is his image of, of, that, of that part of the poetic voice, which goes its own linguistic way. But uh, to my ears, this poem is full of reminiscences of Sviernikov and, and the people who surrounded Sviernikov, the futurists. Um, uh, in particular, um, I see their names. I see, well, I will talk about this a little bit later on, but I see, I see the names, this, this image of the flute whose sound ripens, repines, and crosses rifts is an evocative image. But I, in these three verbs, I hear the names. I hear a kind of a Slevnikovian encoding of the names of certain people. And in particular, this cross rifts, which sounds odd in Russian, uh, I think is uh, the reference there is to the futurist, minor futurist poet, Grucionich, who had this book, who wrote this book, and who had this idea. The book was called Dvigalogia, Shiftology, and his idea was that you could use, uh, uh, words don't have to be cut up in the way they're usually cut up. You could you could have a text where the, the, a word began in the second half of one word and then continued in the, in the first half of the next word, so crossing the rift between it. And that would be the new word. So his, he wrote these poems where you can, uh, there are these words inside words that, uh, that are the poem. Um, so, uh, but of course, crossing rifts can also be made, up, made sense of in other ways. I will read the poem now. The Greek flutes, Theta and Iota, unsated by word of mouth, beholden to no one, unmolded, ripened, repined, crossed with. And it cannot be abandoned or quenched by clenching the teeth or nudged with the tongue into language or subdued by using the lips. And the flutist will never rest easy. He imagines that he is alone, that he sculpted his native ocean out of purple clays long ago. With whispers bright and aspiring, his memory spurs his lips. He has obtained to be sparing. He parcels out sounds with rips. In his wake, we shall not repeat him, 
by marring clay in our hands. And when I was filled with the ocean, my own measure became mortal to me. And my own lips are unlovely, for murder grows from that root, and I dwindle, unwillingly, unwillingly dwindle, the indifferent force of the sweet. So murder grows from the same root as my own lips, because in Russian, the word for lips is gubi, and the word for murder is gubit. It's literally the, well, they're unrelated etymologically, but it's the same, the same uh, cluster of sounds. And so lips don't care what the sound means or what they end up meaning. But of course, uh, to the poet, it makes a difference. And um, uh, his echoes uh, other poems in which Mandelstam wrote from this period in which he wrote, spoke of poetry as um, something that was not necessarily good for him or um, his, his. In the uh, penultimate uh, uh, stanza, um, of this poem, uh, there's in his wake we shall not repeat him by marring clay in our hands. In Russian, in the Russian, there's a whole uh, an, a kind of orgy of of the consonant cluster m, mar or more. След за ним мы его не повторим. Помня глины в ладонях моря, и когда я наполнился морем, стала морем мне мера моя. Uh, so, Mandelstam's uh, use of assonances was usually less blatant than this, and I think in this, I capture a little bit of it. I say I have marring and measure and mortal to some extent, capture something, but um, since this poem is about the layer of meaning of language that underlies fully formed meaning, some, some version of a deep structure, not a syntactic deep structure, but some other kind of deep structure, semantic deep structure. Um, I think these, to my reading, to my ears, uh, these uh, words ref refer, these mars refer both to the, the linguist mar, uh, kind of a, an amusing reference to him, who had the same ideas um, about language. And they also refer, again, in my reading, to um, Marcius. Marcius and his, um, and his contest with Apollo, the Greek myth. Uh, because Mundishtam's uh, uh, friend, the poet Benedict Lipschitz, uh, back in the very early days uh, of future, even before, had a poem called The Flute of Marcius. Um, a translation of which I put in my afterward because Yifschitz is an interesting poet who has not been much translated and in which he conceives of, uh, he, he, he transports the kind of between Apollo and Marcius. Remember that Apollo played the lyre and Marcius played the flute. Um, he transposes that into language uh, and what would that contest, so it's about Marcius, but the contest now, not, not, Taking the field of battle being not music, but language. So there's an ap Apollinean aspect of language, the, 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 the layer of meanings and explicit concepts. And then there's the kind of um, lower sonic uh, wind instrument aspect of language where the meanings are not explicit. And so Lifschitz's poem uh, is about the fact that this was suppressed by Apollo, but it lives on and, 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 it, and we hear it louder and louder around us and eventually it will arise and overturn Apollo's dominance. Uh, so I, I, I hear in this poem a reference to that old poem by Lucius and that is why the flute is a Greek flute. The flute in the poem is a Greek flute. It's actually Marcius's flute. The Greek flute, Theta and Iota, unsated by word of mouth, Right and retind crossed rift. I would like to read a poem, uh, a poem from the same period, written a little bit earlier, um, in which 
um, uh, which is actually, I think, about Sierpnikov. Um, it's called Prometheus. Well, it's not Prometheus. It's called uh, uh, Where Are the Bound and Fastened Moans. Um, it's a poem written a few months before the poem I just read. Chlebnikov uh, was always on the Gestamic mind during these months and these last few years. Where are the bound and fastened moans? Where is Prometheus, the rock's support and buttress? And where is the hawk and the yellow-eyed burst of claws emerging from a lowered forehead? All that is gone. Tragedy is no more. But these lips pressing themselves forward, but these lips enter right into the core of Aeschylus the later, of Sophocles the lover. He is an echo and a hello, a milestone, no, a plowshare. The stone and air theater of growing ages has risen to its feet, and everybody wants to see everybody, those who were born, the deathlings, and the deathless. In my reading of this poem, it's a poem um, which does not have Khlyabnikov in it, apparently, but it's about Khlyabnikov. I think the lips refer to Khlyabnikov's lips, actually. Uh, I have uh, an old edition of poems by Khlyabnikov in which there's a picture of him on the cover, an old drawing made by a contemporary in profile with you know, his lips, his lips, protruding lips. He's not the only, the only Russian poet who had big lips from that time, Pasternak also had big lips. The more telltale sign is the word for milestone in Russian is Vyecha, which are Khlyabnikov's initials, and they would be pronounced Vyecha. Uh, the, uh, and uh, the meaning of the poem is that tragedies can no longer exist, times have changed, but with Khlyabnikov, uh, we, uh, in a way, in a sense, go beyond tragedy into the into the very uh, into into the tragedy being played out in language, and it's the stone and air theater of growing ages uh, is a vision, I think, of language and of everything that's done in language, uh, of linguistic uh, utterances of speech acts and so forth, and literary acts, and um, in language, all of that is still present. It's the Greek amphitheater uh, uh, now embodied in in the in the linguistic landscape. Well, I will I will I will give examples of some the most vivid use of Khlebnikov's approach uh, and my, what I think of as my most more successful uh, uh, translations of them. I will share my 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 personal fantasies with you since this is only Zoom. Uh, the Russian word for moans in the first line of this poem is ston, ston which appears in other uh, poems by Mendelstam, and it sounds a lot like the English word stone, which uh, uh, is a key concept for Mendelstam. It was the title of his first book of poems, Timing Stone. And um, it, 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 it was a lifelong image for the word, for him, the stone as a word, the word as a stone that has its own history and endurance and so forth. So um, just as an example of, I will, I will the, the, the interesting connection is with the poem that he wrote right around the same time as this poem, same days, uh, in which, um, the scene of Prometheus's punishment for Caucasus also appears, uh, and whose uh, subject matter is a stone, um, a, 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 which, which I will turn to in a second, but I just wanted to take a little detour and um, show, uh, as an example of these kind of interlinguistic uh, plays that this is an illustration of, I want to show a more a vivid example. The more previous one, the poem about Rembrandt. This poem uh, is about Rembrandt. It's a kind of a self-portrait of Mendelstam, uh, written also during the last half year of his exile in Baronish. And uh, the first line is Rembrandt. Rembrandt is described as a master of chiaroscuro, as a ma martyr of chiaroscuro. I'm sorry. So in in, in English or in French, uh, the words for master and martyr are quite similar. And 
a creative and natural uh, variation to make on the word master. Ma Ma Rembrandt is, of course, the master of chiaroscuro. He described them as the martyr of chiaroscuro. In Russian, these words are nothing alike. So uh, it, it, it's a word that makes more sense in translation than in, uh, in the original. Or it makes sense in the original if you have other languages in mind. And I will read the poem. Like Rembrandt, martyr of light and shadow, I have gone deep into the muteness of time. And the starkness of my burning rib is guarded neither by those warders nor by this warrior who slumber in the storm. Will you forgive me, splendid fellow, master and father of the black green murk, with the eye of the falcon feather and the jewel box smoldering in midnight's harem? Trouble for no one's good, trouble and can but harm the tribe whose flame is billowed by twilight fellow. So the subject of the poem is that Rembrandt, working in the dark, offers this embarrassment of riches, this, this, this jewel, uh, and fiery images, and um, which might be out of place in, in such a dismal context in which uh, in which Mandrisham found himself, and, I, and Mandrisham was talking about himself also, and the riches he offered in his poetry, which might have been out of place in the context in which he was writing them. Uh, he described another poem written about, around the same time as a material lump of gold. So he was thinking about uh, his poems as something very precious and rich and alive with flames in a way, uh, and uh, considering their inappropriateness to the context, the bleak context of the late 1930s in the Soviet Union, where they were being written. Um, so that's, that's what this point is done. But, but this is a vivid example of his borrowing from other languages. Uh, so now I would get back to the other poem, which is uh, the poem right before um, the Prometheus poem, um, uh, today I'm in a spider web of light. Today I'm in a spider web of light. Spider web of, web of light. I do a close reading of this poem. In my book. A spider web of light is a retina, a, a web for light, filled with light. Today, so he pictures himself inside a retina, inside an eye. Today I'm in a spider web of light, as if in black hair and in fair. What people need is light and air of blue, and they need bread and Elbrus mountain snow. And there is none who might enlighten me, while I will hardly find one on my own. Not in the Ural, not in the Crimea, there are no such transparent weeping stones. The people need a poem mysteriously theirs, to be awakened by it all their days, and in the sound of it to wash forever, as in a flaxen curl, a nut brown wave. Elbrook Mountain is uh, supposedly the place where Prometheus was chained in the Caucasus and bound and fastened. Uh, and this poem is about uh, a search for a stone uh, that would be a kind of eye to people from which they would wake up. The, um, the word um, which I translate as enlighten me, and there is none who might enlighten me, is Pasavietavatsa. Uh, it's none, literally none, none whom, uh, with whom, none to, nobody to counsel me. And this word is Pasavietavatsa, to take counsel with. Uh, Soviet is the same as the Soviet and the Soviet Union, but it's also very close to the word Svet, which means light. So it's, um, that's why I translated it as enlightening trying to capture at least one of these associations, um, uh, echoing the light in the first stanza. So uh, the ideas of the, the, the word itself is, uh, is a kind of, uh, imagine the kind of introduction of light, in, in, introduction of light, Soviet, into Soviet, into the Soviet, into the Soviet, 
world. And then the next line, he describes the expanse of that world, the Urals and the Crimea, from the Urals to the Crimea, from sea to shining sea, you're not going to find such a stone. And I'm not going to find one on my own, and nobody who can enlighten me because maybe uh, nobody's around with whom I might take counsel. One more, just to continue with this uh, uh, association between stone and um, word and moans from the other poem. I, I just want to read one more poem uh, along these lines, an earlier poem called Prevailing Over Nature's Enduration. This is a poem from um, a cycle of poems, uh, a suite of poems, uh, all about the creative process as it unfolds in a, a poet's mind or in evolution, in, in evolutionary processes or in the world. Uh, uh, um, but it has, it has the same linguistic um, move that the other poems have. So let me read it. Prevailing over nature's induration, the eye of harder blue inferred its law. In the earth's crust, minerals riot, and the cry strains at the breast like four. So the word for cry that our translator is cry is stone. So, and the stone strains at the breast like four. Um, again, there's a Link, linking between geological images and, and utter stone and stone, stone, moan. And the unhearing preformation labors along a road that bends into a horn to understand space and its inner surplus, its implied pedal, its implied dome. Um, so the eye penetrates underground into nature and, and is able to uh, expose what is in there to its knowledge. From underground, nature seeks to evolve into some kind of explicit reality, and the same thing um, happens. The imagery in the second stanza is more biological. Uh, there's a preformation, some kind of embryo, something in an embryonic state, and it struggles um, um, to discover uh, the, the, the possibilities implied in space for its unfolding. Um, these images are, in a way, very similar to the image of the roots uh, that I talked about in the beginning, the roots of words that are there subterraneously and that will see, try to unfold into explicit meanings. Um, on the surface, accessible to consciousness. So now a few um, of what I think are more successful, my more successful um, um, attempts to mimic Munglishtam's approach to language, uh, to embody certain aspects of it in English. I mean, this is this was my my um, goal throughout these translations. But um, let me just let me just Read a, just to, to illustrate what, I'm, what I have in mind. So I just, just to give you an example of what I'm talking about. So this is a long poem. It's a kind of a, it's, it's an apocalyptic poem, which he described as an oratorio, and it has many sections. I just wanted, the example I have in mind is in the first stanza. So um, I will read that and maybe I'll, I'll read the first section. But the first stanza is, as you see, let this air be the one to witness it with its heartbeat carrying far, even in dugouts, environing, virulent, an outlet-less ocean, a gas. So uh, the third line um, literally is even in dugouts or trenches, um, active, or rather omnivorous, omnivorous active. Um, um, but uh, I, I the word, the Russian word for omnivorous, uh, uh, the Russian word for poison and the Russian word for food seem to come from the same root, yad and yada. And the Russian word for omnivorous has the word poison in the middle of it, siyadne, yad. Uh, so when you read this in Russian, it means omnivorous, 
but because of the associations with war and gas, uh, the clear images of poison. So I realized this at some point in recent months, I was thinking about the word virus when all this coronavirus stuff began. And um, so, and that it's obvious in Russian that the poem refers to poison, but it's not at all obvious in English if I just translate it as omnivorous. So I, this is one of my, the, re, the more, more recent changes I made in my old translation. Um, and instead of active and omnivorous, I, following Mundustam's example, took that little root of beer, virus, and also found another word with the same root to, re, to, to echo it. So hence the new line, even in dugouts and Byron and Bierben. Why, why don't I read the first section? Um, Let this air be the one to witness it with its heartbeats carrying far. Even in dugouts, environing virulent, an outlet-less ocean, a gas. How these stars are denunciatory. They just have to keep staring. What for? For passing judgment on the judge and the witness at this outlet-less ocean, this gas. And the rain, that unfriendly sower, that manna without a name, still remembers the crosses that dotted this V-shaped battle line. And the people, cold and feeble, will kill and starve and freeze, while inside his renowned monument, the unknown soldier lies. Teach me, you feeble swallow, who have forgotten how to fly, how without wings or a rudder to abide the grave in the sky. And for one Mikhail Lermontov, I will answer on all counts how a hole in the air gapes for man, and the coffin fixes its slouch. So uh, the poem is about wasps that suck on the Earth's axis. And this poem is this image, this strange image of wasps that suck on the axis of the Earth, uh, is generated practically out of a Russian, a pun in Russian. So the, in Russian, the word for wasp is asa, osa. The word for axis is oy, very similar words. And out of this acronym, excuse me, Mendlishtam has generated this image, this striking image. Um, the same uh, sound cluster, oy, also appears in his name, oysia. Oysia, as he was known, so it's 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 a rich it's a rich sound cluster, and also in Stalin's name, of course. The first line, uh, armed with it, which I translate, armed with the vision of the subtle wasp, "Вооруженный um, зрением узких ос." Uh, in in Russian, the word wasp could have very naturally been replaced by eyes, armed with the vision of the of the literally armed with the vision of narrow of the narrow eyes. And it makes perfect sense in the line that way. So what, eyes have been taken away and wasps have been put in their place. And uh, it's very much in Sierra because of being this maneuver. And a meaning has been discovered uh, by exploring this assonance. And so, of course, in, in English, translating this poem to English, I, I, wasps and axes do not sound alike in English. So what to do? So. My attempt here, a somewhat successful illustration but of what I try to do everywhere um, uh, with the same kind of problem uh, is as follows. Uh, well, it's, it's to mimic it, to mimic what he did, to imitate it, not necessarily with the words that he managed to put into some kind of semantic um, um, fun, but with other words. So this is what I came up with. Armed with the vision of the subtle wasp that suck on the Earth's axis, the Earth's axis. I access everything that I have seen, and I do not draw, nor do I sing, nor do I drag the dark voice low. I only drink life in and take delight in envying the mighty coming wasp. 
Oh, would that I might also be compelled by and by sleep and death by passing, pricked by the air and by midsummer warmth, to hear the earth's accent, the earth's accent. Um, so this poem, actually, like the very first poem I read, um, with a certain similarity, though the poem about the roots, not mine, not yours, but theirs, theirs is the strength. Theirs is what strength reaches the end of lineal descent. And here also, armed with a vision of, it, it's, 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 a, some, it's, it's not, not me, I'm, I'm powerless, but there's something there, these things out there, creatures out there that have the real power. And I have, or we can get access to their, to their power in a kind of indirect way. There, they're here, they're lost. There, they're the they, unnamed they. Um, so at a first approximation, this poem can be read as being about the same thing as the other poem. Uh, and you can imagine the wasps, the subtle wasps that stuck in the earth's axis as words. Uh, that this os, this root os, in his own name, Osha. So, um, so, you know, he can have access to what they have access to. He, can, he, he can't suck on the axis of the earth, but his name does it for him. So he has relation to it. Um, uh, uh, um, of course, it's not just his name. So the, the mighty cunning wasp, that image is very evocative of my ears, probably from many Russian readers, ears of Stalin these two episodes, so who has the same article in his name. So, so this takes it beyond just words. Uh, imagining something out there, dark entities, not dark entities that have, that can suck on the core of some kind of reality, the axis of the earth, uh, to which Mandelstam is connected only indirectly, only indirectly, uh, he, and and he and in his indirect relation to it, he rehearses it to no purpose. He doesn't. He not. He doesn't. He doesn't access it directly. Um, I want to read one more poem uh, where I think he succeeded in uh, catching his assonance. It's uh, "Do Not Compare." He had Dante in mind when he wrote this, and he had Dante in mind during these last few months uh, a lot. Uh, and this um, is full of very beautiful uh, plays and words in Russian, which I try to approximate from a great distance. So let me let me read this and maybe talk about it a little bit later afterwards. Do not compare. Who lives is beyond compare. Literally, the Russian word for the Russian line is "Do not compare." Who is alive is um, unlevelable, unlevelable. To compare and to level is the same word in Russian. So um, he cannot be leveled. He cannot be made one with the plane. It's all the same way in Russian. So this is the way it came out in English. Do not compare. Who lives is beyond compare. Agreeing with the parity of the plane, I felt somehow caressed and scared. And the sky's circle was my pain. And I addressed my servant, the heir, awaiting tidings from him with service. And I prepared to sail and sailed along the arc of uninitiated journey. Where there's more sky for me, there I am ready to roam. And it is clear despair that won't release me from the Veronish hills, which are still young, to those of all mankind in Texas. So he's, do not compare. I think this poem is about um, comparing the living and the dead, and that a living poet, such as Mandelstam still was, uh, has no um, no uh, has has no basis of comparison to any dead poet like Dante. So who lives is beyond compare, um, and hence uh, the um, Caressed and scared, um, which scared of 
of of the debt that's co that's coming, but caressed by the by by, by possibility too. Uh, I will read a couple more. So I this other I, I have a there's another poem. There's a few other poems in which he has Dante uh, on his mind. Uh, so I'm lost in the sky. There's there's two poems with the same quatrain. Uh, and so here, so in, in the poem I just read, um, he can't compare himself to Dante. To, to somebody who's dead, he's, he's forced to live with this sky still vertical. And uh, this poem and the one following it, I will read both. Uh, they have this, they start with the same four lines and then um, go in, into somewhat different directions. Uh, they're also comparing his situation to Dante's and um, um, the meaning of the Watching, which they both share, is that for Dante's, uh, for the for the for the Dante's vision of the sky, um, Dante had a clear geography of the sky in his mind uh, and a geometry of it. And so when he sent up his nine athletic discuses, the, the nine spheres of the Paradiso, um, flying up into the sky, uh, they he had a sense of where they were. Whereas Magistam, in the position he finds himself in. He is in the same sky, but is lost. Let me read it. I am lost in the sky. What to do? He to whom it is near replies, ringing out is easier for you. You discuss it down page nine. Nothing can take me from life. It dreamers kill and caress so that ears, eyes, and their orbit overflow with Florentine grief. And those laurels with stinging caresses Lay them not on my brow, but my heart tear it up into ringing, into ringing deep pieces of blue. And when I sleep after serving in life as a living a friend, will echo deeper and higher the reply of the sky in my breast. I am lost in the sky. What to do? He to whom it is near replies, ringing out is easier for you. You discuss Dante's nine. Out of breath, out of black, out of blue. If I am not ancient, not useless, you who stand over me, if you are a cupbearer and capster, give me force without idle foam to drink to the rotating tower of breakfast, best in the city. Places blue, places black, darling places, declaring the deepest blue, vernal ice, ice of spring, ice eternal. Cloud, the brawlers of charm. Hush, the rain cloud being led by the rain. Hi, Deb. Well, thanks very much. Yes, I really uh, you know, like your translations and you know, the ones I read before and these new versions. Um, I had a couple of questions. So, um, I mean, I agree with you about the importance of, you know, Chlebnikov uh, for Mandelstam. I mean, I suppose among Mandelstam critics, that was something that um, uh, Victor Grigoriev particularly sort of talked about, but um, perhaps not many other Mandelstam critics have really focused in on that. So um, have you found in, in your investigations, you know, things that um, Grigoriev said that were convincing? I mean, in some ways, I think he goes too far. Almost everything he sees in Mandelstam is always about Klebnikov, including the old to Stalin, is really an old to Klebnikov, and so on and so forth. So I wondered you know, how, how you would navigate that particular. Um, Grigory says, I don't, I don't know if I've read him. Uh, I might have read him. I think I came across, oh, the, um, does he talk about this milestone, this viaja in the poem on Prometheus? Um, I, I think he made, I mean, he talks a lot about the, about the octets, but he talks um, you know, a lot about um, certainly the, the Stalin old. Um, I mean, he was probably like the main main Russian um, Klebnikov scholar. The, the, the many of, of the books on Klebnikov. The, the book I, I love on Mendelstam is by um, Amelian Mother. I don't know if you know them. Yeah, yes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so she, she's a Klebnikov scholar, and so she, uh, they, they, they have a lot of these ideas also. Yeah. Um, a lot of, a, a lot of, you know, my, my own thinking about Mendelstam is yeah, inspired them or continues them, continues their. So that's that's whom I've read. Um, you know, he was definitely a presence in Mandelstam's mind, in, in my reading. I don't think he was the coded subject of every single poem, mm -hmm. but I think there's a, a definite uh, evolution in Mandelstam, the growth uh, in, in Mandelstam's handling of of 
of poetic matter over the course of the 20s and 30s that is really very independent of his surroundings or you know his biographical uh, state condition chapter uh, uh, it, it, and it's it's just him and um, the technical is definitely a presence but I don't I don't think I don't see it as necessarily this presence being encoded in everything but I'd have to I'd have to look at right you know, so you yeah, I, I think you go too far with it, but it's 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 certainly interesting. Uh, yeah, uh, I think I think you know in the in the early, in the thirties they published a collected work of uh, mm -hmm. several volumes, and they're different. If you buy you know the latest collected works, they more manuscripts have been found and things have been amended. But I I would I mean for Mundustam scholars I would look. I'm not one. I'm a translator mm -hmm. of him, but I would look at those editions. Because Midrashtam had those editions and he carried them around with him. Uh, and so in some point, they're different from later versions, later editions. Uh, so no, that would be interesting. And just one brief follow-up. I mean, I really like you know, a lot of your resolutions and in the Rembrandt poem, I mean, you're obviously, um, in this version at least, are uh, panning on the on the plamia, sublimia thing. So you so, you know, uh, because it's only the one word, but you have both the flame and the tribe. In the sense there, yeah. were you also tempted to try and get both bellows and furs in it as well, or you thought the having like Possible. four words yeah. the two was too much? <laughs> well, bellows and well, uh, no, I think I think the meaning there is bellows, yes. but uh, it's not. I mean, furs it's, it's, yeah. it's not it. furs means bellows, so it's bellows. Mm -hmm. uh, there's I don't know how much other people are interested in this, but there's another poem in which so the Russian word uh, uh, for uh, bellows. Literally, it means fur, because I guess they were fur of animals. It's, the Russian word for bellows is the same word as the word for wineskin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the same word, wineskin and bellows, yes. for obvious reasons. It's the same word. And uh, in the poem I read about Rembrandt, bellows are mentioned, very clearly done. But in a poem written around the same time, uh, I sing when my throat is wet, my soul is dry. Mm -hmm. uh, my vision damp enough, my mind not too, too clever. Is the wine wholesome? Are the wineskins sound? It's the same word when you use an sense of wineskin. And in this poem, it refers to the long. Mm -hmm. the, the wine wholesome, are the wineskins sound? Uh, there's a whole image, a whole chain of images of singing in this poem. But it's the same word used in the poem by Rembrandt in a different meaning. There's no way to cast that. Mm -hmm. That's written right around the same time. Yeah. Obviously, he had the word on, on his mind. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple of comments. Uh, somebody's watching from Colombia. Uh, Julian, thank you for joining us. And Julian says, thank you for sharing your language and poetry knowledge with us. You know. uh, and uh, Dean Whitaker says, interesting bit of history on deep thinking poets. And then we have a question from Paul Hutchinson, who says, I would be interested in Mr. Bernstein's comments on his translations and approach to the language and symbolism of the poems, compared with earlier translations by Clarence Brown and David McDuff. I can answer. I'm not a fan of uh, earlier translations um, of Mandersam. I mean, I don't know if I'm a fan of my own translations because I did this for my own strange reasons, but uh, they came out this way. But I I hear nothing and virtually there's a there's a few poems by a couple of people that I like, I think are successful. But uh, uh, I think David Macduff is, uh, I haven't uh, read those in detail. I've read other things by him. I mean, he has a interesting good year I, I, I respect the guy but um, I haven't come across any published translations of Mandishtam that have been at all interesting to me uh, they um, they sin in different ways but what is remarkable uh, uh, to Russian years about Mandishtam is connected to what I've been talking about I mean apart from the meaning of the poems and all that there's this there's this uh, the, the the linguistic aspect of them is very important and very beautiful in Russian, and so um, uh, that's what I've tried to focus on, at least to give people some idea 
of, of why uh, he has the stature that he has in Russian. Because, I mean, and then sometimes, you know, people focus on the, on the meaning of the poems insofar as it can be deciphered. And, um, and the tendency in the English-speaking world is to connect it to his life and to be interested in the Mendelstam for his biography. And his biography is interesting like the biography of any poet, but if he didn't have the biography that he had, his stature as a poet would be completely unaffected. It would, it would be, you know, he, he could have had the biography of Emily Dickinson. Uh, so this does not come across in English. He's not interesting because of the way in which he died or because of the conditions under which he lived. I mean, any poet, you know, it, the, your view of any poet is enriched by that. But um, um, the same is not the case, for example, for Ahmadova, who, without her biography, would be uh, uh, would be a completely different figure. And without the way this biography is embodied in her work. But for Mandushtam, for, for all the poets I mentioned, the biography is ultimately irrelevant. Uh, and um, so my, 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 you know, for whatever reason I translated these poems, I think what they can bring to English language readers of Mandushtam is some appreciation from a distance of what is going on in his involvement with linguistic matters and poetic matters rather than uh, reading them as a reflection of his life. Well, thank you. I, yeah, I really appreciate the uh, separating biography from poetry uh, because you see that a lot, um, especially if you are working at a bookstore and you talk to people every day and you see people coming in more for history than for poetry sometimes. And uh, I, I really like this angle of, of the lecture. We have another um, question. Can I, can, I, can, I, can I say something? Can I mention something about what you just said? So in particular, Mandishtam has suffered from this because the poetry is so obscure and it's been impossible to translate it or to translate it as beautiful objects into English. So really the only thing people know about him, I mean, many people know about him who admire him is his biography. And so I, there are um, two poems about Mandushtam by poets I greatly admire, one of which, so by uh, Seamus Heaney, he's got a poem about Mandushtam, which is a wonderful poem. And it, the biography is brought in, but it, 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 it is alive to Mandushtam's poetic aspect in his language. And the other poem is by the poet Jeffrey Hill, in which Mandrishtam is uh, remarkable only for the way he died. And I think it's, it's, not, uh, it's, it's, it's not worthy of the poet who wrote. <laughs> I mean, he's at least that approach to Mandrishtam. The poem in itself is a fine poem. We have another question from a uh, YouTube audience, and it's from Matthew Solomon. And um, the question is, Ilya, why did Pasternak conceal the lingual root? To what effect? Yeah. Uh, uh, I think it was, uh, you know, something about his um, personality and his inspiration. I mean, that's, Siyadnikov was, wanted to go into the gain of everything and it was that was natural to him and Pasternak was a different kind of person uh, interested in tradition in, in different ways and just psychologically a different person um, and also it's it's a kind of a challenge to you know do something very wild and unusual but then to hide it from from everybody except for those who like his contemporary poets could see it. And the Stam saw it clearly in Pasternak in the same essay in which he writes about Sjernikov that I quoted from. He writes about Pasternak uh, doing along similar lines, uh, although he, for his own purposes, puts Sjernikov above Pasternak. So that's uh, why I say that Sjernikov is, can, be, can be seen in part as Mandelstam's teacher. First of all, um, my compliments, huge amount of them. Um, all the hyperbole that uh, 
that applies here. This is absolutely wonderful. If this was already answered um, or mentioned, I do apologize in advance. Um, how you got started with Mandrishnam, I think probably everybody that's watching or listening probably remembers the first thing I read by Mandrishnam. It's just one of those things. Maybe not. But um, which one was it for you? Do you remember? You mean translating or reading? Either. But let's start with reading. Well, with reading, uh, I, uh, you know, as a teenager, I liked the poems written in Crimea and the teens, uh, which I like much less now. Like uh, uh, so yeah, and those, those poems. Um, and at what point yeah, was I like the... Them. I like them. They're, they're wonderful poems. But, sure. Yeah. The conscious decision to start translating it as opposed to reading it. Well, that wasn't a conscious decision. So I, so, uh, I, I mean, the way it actually happened was that I, when I was in college, I wrote a long paper on Mendelstam and um, senior thesis. Uh, uh, and then uh, 15 years later, I think, so 10 years later, I, I came across the paper and uh, I thought the paper was pretty good, but the, the poems weren't, were all in Russian. I hadn't translated them, and so it was lying on my desk for a while. And then I started just playing with, with the poems, and I, find, I found a way to translate them that satisfied something in me. I mean, I have this, uh, you know, d disease that probably many people who write and speak two languages have, which is you see something in one language and you are, that you like, you, you automatically try to translate it to see what it would sound like translated into the other language. So I, I did this. I have a, in this, in this book, I have a translation of the Ode to Stalin uh, that I did at some point um, um, when I was young, uh, just for that reason, just to see if I could do it in a certain way quickly. Um, you know, in a way, that response to a poem, translating it, is a kind of a sterile response to a poem. You're just translating the poem. Uh, a true response to a poem is writing another poem with that poem as your inspiration. But this is, kind, you know, short of that, you just translate it. And so I, at some point, when I was playing with these old poems, uh, I found something that, that seemed to my ears to work in English, uh, which was I, I needed to have um, the music that understands sort of overall music, more or less suggested in the English. Uh, there are translations which ignore the ignore it altogether, and so those I can't. Uh, they're difficult for my my ears to accept. So I needed I needed some semblance of meter and some semblance of rhyme. But what I found was that you didn't need to actually fully implement the the meter and the rhyme. You could just suggest them. So you could suggest. Without filling in all the details, and for the rhyme, I found, uh, you know, just showing if lines, line endings were masculine or feminine was enough. You know, you, you see which rhyme. You have an echo of the rhyme and an echo of the meter, and that that's enough. And once I, I think I sort of stumbled on that, and then I just I had this uh, bout of understand translating understand for a couple of weeks. I translated a lot of poems. And then they sat for a long time, and then just for years and years, I continued. Um, I continued, you know, living with them. I write. I mean, using them as a, you know, sustenance, sustenance for my own poetry, but also playing with them and revising them. I, I discovered this strange thing happens with uh, translation of poetry, which is that when you when you when when I write a poem, uh, at some point. The clouds part, and you know, the light shines on the poem, and then it's done. And that's the point you've been waiting for, and then, then the poem is done. But when you're translating a poem, that doesn't happen. So, because it happened for the poet, but it's not going to happen for the translator. So, you can translate it, and then you can always do more, and then a little more, and uh, oops, and then that's a process that never ends. So, I I published a first edition of this book a few years ago, and then immediately began um, 
making changes, more and more changes, and in my opinion, improving the problems. I mean, uh, capturing more and more of, of these of these hidden things in them in English. So one 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 part is just to to be aware of them and to know that they're there, and then another one is to come up with English English parallels, equivalences, echoes. So um, so I hope to be done with Nindustan at this point. I don't want I don't want to keep doing it, but. Uh, they, they won't let you, they wouldn't let me go. Like recently, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, sometimes just lines come to you. To me, that's how I live with the poetry. Just certain lines come and then they go. And the, this year, the Мне на плечи бросается век волкодав has been coming a lot. So how do you translate that? I can read it. So for the rattling valor of ages to come, for the high tribe of men, at the feast of the fathers, I have forfeited my cup, and my joy and my honor as well. A wolfhound age leaps up on my back, but I am not a wolf by blood. Better find me a coat of Siberian steps and stuff me inside like a hat. Let me no more look at the coward, at the mire, at the bloody bones in the wheel, that the blue foxes blaze the whole night through in their primordial beauty for me. Lead me into the night where the Yenisei flows and the pine tree reaches the star, because I am not a wolf by blood and can only be killed by my like. So the last line, which is a little bit ungainly in English. I had a different line. I couldn't think of a way to do it right because I, I, my line didn't, you know, it was something like only my equal will kill me, but it ruins the rhythm, the whole flow of the poem. So I, I found, so then I discovered that the last line gave a lot of trouble to Mungustam himself and he wasn't happy with this last line. He finally settled on It was written, I think, several years after, finalized, several years after he wrote the poem. So it often happens in translating that lines that are extremely successful and beautiful and in Russian will find English lines for themselves relatively easily. Uh, these are poems, uh, the, his last year in Baranej, he became friends with a young woman who then, um, with whom he and his wife became friends with a young woman with whom uh, they then left the manuscripts when they left, of, or sometime later, of all his poems written in Baronish, and um, uh, she preserved them and um, through the war. Uh, so they were they were saved uh, thanks to her. So these are two poems dedicated to her, uh, and the first one is. Uh, Again, he has Dante on his mind. There's a very clear, to me, uh, reminiscence here of Dante's very famous one of his earliest sonnets. Um, and the, the meter is the same as the sonnet. So she walks, this young woman walks with a limp. So that's, that explains the, the first line. Slightly unlevel upon hollow ground with loveliness in her uneven set she walks, springing a little bit ahead of her quick girlfriend and young man companion. She is drawn forward by a constrained freedom, born of a vivifying imperfection. And it may well be that a lucid guest would linger for a while in her steps about the fact that this springtime weather for us is the foremother of the tomb and that it will begin this way forever. And the second poem, the same woman in the same meter, but now um, bringing it back to Russia, to a Russian context, uh, in a way. The first line, there are women who belong to the raw earth that I chanted. There are women who belong to the raw earth. The first part of this line is an echo, there are women, of a very famous poem by Nikrasov. Uh, there are women in Russian villages with uh, calm dignity uh, in their faces and so on and so on. So 
So to begin a poem in this way is the Russian music echoes something they already know and the, the something very Russian. And the the end of this line, of course, the raw earth um, alludes to the raw mother earth or mother raw earth, might Zemya, this kind of primordial um, uh, deity of the Slavic pantheon, this image of the earth. So there are women who belong to the raw earth, whose every footfall is resounding sobbing. To escort the resurrected and to be the first to greet the dead of their calling. To demand tenderness from them is a crime, and to part from them is beyond our powers. Today an angel, tomorrow a worm of the grave, and the day after nothing but a likeness. Footsteps that pass by once will pass away. Flowers are immortal, the sky is all embracing, and all that is to be only a promise. Thank you. This was a wonderful reading and I think it will resonate with a lot of people.